the day shall come that every soul will see present whatever they have done. The actual action is present. It's not this result, the actual action is present before him, and you cannot deny it. Likewise, that day, whatever bad, evil people have done will be present right in front of them. Here the person wishes, I wish there was so much distance between me and my deeds. Indeed, the person is embarrassed, ashamed. It's as if you cannot separate yourself and deny it. And Allah this way makes you be conscious of your own soul. In fact, sorry, it said Allah you had from the nafs of Allah. Allah will uh, makes you frightened, makes you fear from him. Like this, or this will come. Make sure you are prepared in front of me, and don't be embarrassed. There is no separation between you and your deeds. But then Allah follows with His mercy. He says, "Allah is merciful to His servants." Qul. That's the emphasis that I'm. And inshallah, Professor Sachidina will emphasize on that. So I will pass by it. Qul in kuntum tuhibun Allah fattabi'awni yuhibkum Allah. Say, if you love Allah. Now, let's see how the, what the context. Allah is talking to his messenger. Say, say to people, if you love Allah. And Rasul doesn't say, if you love me, say, if you love Allah. That means I'm not here, I'm only two. Goal is Allah. If you love Allah, then I'm the two. فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهِ Follow me, so Allah will love you. In other words, there's a condition here. It's just not, it's not just saying, oh, I love Allah, Allah must love me back. Allah loves everybody, but then Allah is Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Rahman is general, Rahim is the part that we're talking about. فَاتَّبِعُونِ يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهِ So you follow, and Rasul says, follow me, so Allah will love you back. وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ And forgives your sins. وَاللَّهُ غَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ Surely Allah is oft forgiving, oft merciful. قُلْ أَتِيُوا اللَّهُ وَالرَّسُولُ The next verse follows the same thing. Say, Follow Allah and His Messenger. And if people turn away, surely Allah do not like those who are unbelievers and will turn away. Brothers and sisters, Salaamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi You can come on this side. Yeah, it's not too far off. The emptiness of this phrase frightens me. <laughs> it's good to see you all here. I am used to 
having my students in my first class, my first line. Uh, of the, so I'm, I regard you as my brothers and sisters. So please do come, come closer to me. You want to, come, come you on, want come to go to paradise, you should be closer to the one who lectures. <laughs> <laughs> no, you are, you are already in paradise. Yes. Um, <coughs> this is the beginning of our lecture series here, and I think uh, Brother Nahidian has extended this invitation to me to come here at least once a month. And if he wants me every week, then I'll come also for every week. But I think he wants to try me out. <laughs> what can I do? What can I deliver? You know, because after all, it's, it's not the same thing. You know, to speak to the students in the university is a different matter. And to speak to the community of the believers is a different matter. And we here, we want to not only teach you, but we also want to advocate a position. Our function is not only to deliver, but also to show through action what we can deliver. We are in the realm of the <clears throat> spiritual existence of the Ahlul Bayt, alayhi salam. And I think that uh, one of the challenges of the Quran is to think about matters that you and I think are important for us. Amazing thing in the Quran is, and I just received a call today from National Geographic, and they are writing an article on the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And uh, they quoted a hadith. I don't know. Maybe you know it. You know, I I couldn't find that hadith. It says, "It doesn't matter." how much you know, it matters how much you've traveled. Does it sound familiar? No. To me? Not to me. Yeah, I, got, I said, no. Um, if traveling is important, then the Quran is itself a testimony. The Quran does say, Kul siru afalam yasiru fil ard. It's constantly reminding Muslims to take upon journey, to travel in the world. And I think what I have in mind tonight is this one of Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim afalam yasiru fil ardi fatakuna lahum qulubun ya'aqiluna biha aw adhanun yasma'una biha fa innaha la ta'ama al-absar walakin ta'ama al-qulubu al-lati fis-sudur the problem is I think it's a general problem by the way I think even in the academic life we find the same problem with the students Students become superficially attached to a topic. And in the community, there is a tendency to oversimplify matters that need contextual discussion, they need counter-contextual discussion. In order to understand religion, there has to be a lot of effort. The Quran says, knowledge will not come to you with ease, it will come with effort. Because if, if there was no struggle and endeavors on the part of humanity, then we would not learn anything seriously. My topics that I want to develop while I'm with you, as long as I'm with you in every month, <coughs> are to deal with a very important subject of the paradigm that you and I are looking for. The paradigm that you and I are looking for, our own betterment. Because the challenge of religion is to make you feel better than what you are at the moment. In other words, there is this call of religion, I would say, generally religions are geared towards that, that. Let's see what kind of difference you make when you bring qualitative faith in your life. 
But we are talking about quality of the faith. Not quantity of the faith. Because quantity is immeasurable. You can't measure the quantity of how much you believe. But what it does to you is measurable. That's why we say the Quran is, for example, the Shams Ghubbira. That surah, if you read, it's going to tell you, you know, that look, on the day of judgment, you will have this problem, this problem. You know, the sky will asunder, you know, the sun will become dark and this and that. And then, immediately there is this ayah, oh, why, why was I killed? This is a small baby girl who would say, why did they bury me? Why did, why did they get rid of me? For what reason was she killed? For what, for what reason she was killed? Now, the moment you bring that verse, then you're talking about a tradition that was prevalent in the pre-Islamic Arabia. That when a daughter was buried, many parents buried the daughter because they thought the daughter was a, a burden on the parents. Sons were highly cherished, daughters were not. This is in Arab culture in the 7th century when the Prophet Sallallahu introduced Fatima to Zara. You can imagine what a revolution it was. Where the girl, where the daughters are not valued for what they are as a human person, the Prophet comes up with this idea that whenever Fatima enters her pre his presence, he stands up for her. This is in Sahih Muslim, Sahih Bukhari by the way. Whenever she entered, the Prophet stood up and then ask her to sit where he was sitting. In other words, that kind of respect was unknown in the culture. Now, if you're reading the verse without the context that is being provided by the history itself, then you are not able to understand the significance of a small verse like, I'm reading this verse of the Quran, says, aren't you traveling, don't you travel? Don't you travel and examine what is happening in this world? Don't you go around and, you know, learn about things? And don't you have, by the way, the word hearts is what, don't you have minds? Heart is a mind here. You know, it's an instrument of thinking. Don't you have mind? Don't you think about these matters? Don't you hear things? Don't you... In other words, two sources of learning, your mind and your ears, your eyes and your ears, your heart and your ears. And all of these are used by the Quran to make you aware that these are instruments of learning. You better make use of them. If you don't make use of them, you remain dull. If your brain is not used now, the research that is being done in Alzheimer, they say that it's good to give the old people, you know, mathematics, give them this Sudoku, I don't know what this game is, you know, and get them to play so that they use their mind so that the brain doesn't become dull and Alzheimer doesn't enter. Now, these are new researches being done and I don't know what will be the final outcome, but certainly what it means is that you are given an instrument we are, which you are supposed to use. If you don't use it, then you are failing to, to follow the objective for which you have been created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, uh, my topics are going to be, let me give you a kind of an overview of what I'm trying to achieve. What I'm trying to achieve is a kind of a course on a search for a paradigm in Islamic history. Will you remember this? A search for a paradigm in Islamic history. By paradigm, I mean exemplary instances, exemplary individuals, whom you and I might call masumin, whom you and I might connect with the wilaya, with the love that we have for them, and which, and I think we are always like the ayah says, قُلْ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ تَحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبِعُونِ فَاتَّبِعُونِ means follow my footsteps. There are two, two things that the Quran uses, إِتَاعَ and ittaba'ah. Ittaa'ah is ittaa'at al-aqwal. When you follow somebody's opinion, you're doing the ittaa'ah. 
When you're doing ittaba, that means you're following somebody's footsteps. You want to find out how exactly he or she is walking so that I can capture their actions and I do the same thing they have done. So there are two things that we are looking at the history, ittaba and ita'a. And both of them are connected with the religious experience of history itself. So our topic then is a search for paradigm in the historical experience of Islamic history itself. And the reason why I'm giving you this is that I want to tease your mind and I think my function is I'm not knowledgeable person. I can simply read and reproduce what I read. But my major contribution in the community, inshallah, is if you recognize it, it will be to tease your minds. I want you to ask questions to yourself. Learning to ask questions to yourself. Don't accept things blindly. This is my request to you. Don't accept whatever I say. Oh, he's a professor. No, I'm a student. Believe it or not, I'm still learning. And many times when I open the Quran, I say, oh my God, you don't know but now that this I exists in the Quran. How many times have you finished reading the Quran? In other words, you and I, we read the history, we hear the history, we know about the Masumin, we are always being told about them, and yet you and I miss the point. We miss the point. The Kirhum bi ayyamillah. Remind them of the days of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Arabs used to talk about Ayyam al Arab. It was just, it was part of their pride to talk about their warfare in the past. The Quran changes it, says no. Every day of your life is a history. It unfolds history in front of your eyes. Things happen, you and I, we don't even notice what is happening to us. We are going through the transformation, cultural transformation, intellectual transformation, economic transformation, and I can say social and political transformation. We are going through this transformation and you and I are not able to anchor somewhere where we can say, my transformation is a valid one, is an authentic one. I am changing for better. I'm not changing for worse. Because that's what you want to make sure that at the end of the day, at the end of every day in your life, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that you went through a yamillah. Every day you struggle between truth and falsehood. You had to pass judgment. You heard stories, you said, that's not true, I'm not going to accept it. You heard a story and said, oh my God, did this happen? I'm for it. In other words, you accept, you reject, you accept, you reject. And this is what Allah wants you to do. He doesn't want you to accept everything that you hear. If Washington Times, Washington Post, or New York Times were the sources of authentic information, even then the Quran would say, think before you accept anything they say. They are not telling you the Quran is very adamant. Whatever is being told in my name to you, in the name of God to you, ask a question, is it from God or not? If you don't ask that question, that means you're willingly submitting to something that doesn't have any validity for your life. And the moment it loses validity, you lose connection with spiritual life, you lose connection with the moral life. Why do you think it's important to be spiritual? Why do you think it's important to be morally upright? And we are all struggling every day, in and out. You go to the office, you're sitting in the office, you're working there. You're asking yourself, a phone rings and you say, should I pick it up? It's from my wife. This is office time. I'm supposed to be working here. I'm not supposed to sit in conversations with my family at this time. They should know that my lunch hour is between 12 and 1. They can call me at that time, not before that. You are making a very tough decision, by the way. And I'm telling you, this challenge is every day in our office, in our life. Should I do it? And the Prophet Sallallahu was very clear. 70% of, of your faith is legitimate eating of your risk. 70%. The 
The time you spend on, call, on calling people in the office time, you are wasting the time of the office for which you are paid illegitimately. I, do you understand? You always talk about halal and haram as if halal haram is zib halal, zib haram. That's a very minimal requirement to buy a properly slaughtered meat which recognizes the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the life of an animal. That's very small part. The major part is the money that I'm getting in my pocket. Is it really mine? Or only part of it is legitimately mine? I'm suggesting something very, very interesting here. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَهُمْ قُلُوبٌ يَعْقِلُونَ بِهَا أَوْ آذَانٌ يَسْمَعُونَ بِهَا فَإِنَّهَا لَا تَعْمَلَ أَبْسَاءَ their, their eyes are not blind. They can see everything. Their eyes are not blind. What is blind is تَعْمَلْ قُلُوبٌ Their mind is blind. They are not thinking by, by their minds and those that are part of their, you know, existence. Now, those I really want, I want us, I want you to interrupt me anytime I say something that doesn't click you. Oh, that's not logical at all. I want you as if I want you to feel that you are in a classroom and you are learning something because I'm 71 years old. Within a few years, I'll die. I'm, I'm, I'm being very honest with you. I'm not going to live forever in this life. Nobody is going to live forever. I have obligations. I have responsibility towards you, towards my family, towards everyone else. And that's why I tell you, my, my students, don't hesitate to interrupt me. If you don't understand something, if you find something I'm saying illogical, raise your hand and say, that's not logical at all. Because this is what the Quran has taught me. Don't accept blood. That lead is not allowed in Usul al -Din. For the very clear reason that I need to understand God, what he wants me to do in this life. If I don't understand my, my creator, what do I understand? Does God, God want me to be blind? And he says, Why to hibbun Allah? Because many of us, have you heard your friends say, Oh, I love God. Oh, come on. Wake up. How much have you claimed to loving God? And look at your behavior. This is what the Quran says. You need objective claims when you make a claim. It's too subjective to say, I love you. You can ask me, what does that mean, Abdul Aziz? What does it mean when you say, I love you? Have you done anything good for me? Have you been any kind of a good friend to me? No. So my claim is an empty claim. And that's how the Quran says, don't make empty claim about God's love. If you love God, then follow the footsteps of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The principle is set. <coughs> Don't make claims that I love Ahl al-Bayt. Show me how do you love Ahl al-Bayt. Show me you recognize the Ma'asumin. Do you recognize the 14 Ma'asumin? What is the source of your recognition of the 14 Ma'asumin? Oh, on your behavior, I don't see anything connected with the 14 Masumin. Not even with the small children of the Masumin. How come you are claiming that you love child? This is, by the way, the claim of Wilaya. We say, I have Wilaya. I love Ahl al-Bayt. I am devoted to Ahl al-Bayt. And Ahl al-Bayt have a right to ask us and to tell us, Kunu lana zayna wa la takunu alayna shayna. Be a source of embellishment for us. So that we can say, look at our followers, what they are doing. Don't be a source of shame to us. This is what the Halibayt are teaching us. In other words, our search in the history is a search of a paradigm. Now I want to give you two paradigms. It means I'm going to give you two examples that we can follow. There's one paradigm that is created by modernity. You and I are living in the modern times. Modern time is telling us that tradition is not important. You must separate yourself from the tradition. That's the only way you can have freedom. Have you heard this? Many, many a times, modernity says you need to be free from tradition. So you ask those advocates of modernity, 
What do you mean by tradition? They will tell you it is something that you do monotonously. It's monotony. It's boring to do the same thing every day. Oh, I pray. Oh, so praying has become for you a tradition. So you pray every day, five times a day, and you don't get any benefit from that. That's what the modernists would say, by the way. You don't have to pray. I've been in places where my colleagues say, you will still pray? Because for them, it's a mystery. Why would I pray? If I'm modern, I shouldn't be praying. You see, the, the assumption is that if you are modern, you don't need to pray. If you are modern, you don't need a tradition. You need something to be free of. You, you don't need any connection. So one paradigm is connected with abandonment of the tradition and adherence to human individuality and human connection with the self. The modernity is very much self-oriented. I'm important. Therefore, I come first. For anything I do, I'm important. I come first. And this is my life, and therefore I can lead it the way I want it. There's no horizontal connection with everyone and with anyone. The second paradigm is Darwinian. Darwin speaks about evolution of ideas, evolution of the world, evolution of the cell, evolution of, you know, even human mind, everything is Darwinian. It is Darwin. Charles Darwin, the great scientist, is telling us that everything is evolutionary. So don't think that you will remain the same after 10 years, after 10 years or after 10 months. You will change because it's part of your process. Evolutionary process means you will change. It is also materialistic. What matters at the end of the day is how much money you have made, what kind of life you are living, what kind of television you have, what kind of cars are you driving, what kind of homes you have. All these things are measured in terms of our material success. Then there is a third element here. Rationalism and relativism. Everything is relative. What I know about God is relative. It will change tomorrow as I grow up. So the knowledge about God is relative. The knowledge about religion is relative. Nothing is absolute. The most troubling aspect is that all morality is relative. I am the master of decision making. I make decisions and I follow my decisions the way I want to follow them. These are the elements of the second paradigm. Which is the paradigm that you think would survive with our community, with our thinking? That's the question. That's the question we are asking. We want a paradigm that takes the tradition seriously. Because tradition is important for us. Family tradition, community tradition, religious tradition, National tradition, cultural tradition, all traditions, Sunnah, Sunnat, Sunan, are important for us. We cannot live without tradition. And even those who say that no, we can live without, without a tradition, Virginia is known to be a traditional state. No Virginian is without a tradition. You open our history, it's full of tradition. I come from the University of Virginia where I worked for 37 years. It's full of tradition. Everything is tradition. Everything, the way you graduate, the way you behave in the classroom, the way you write your papers, the way you, you know, pledge your honor code and everything. Everything is part of the Virginia tradition. So what do you mean by tradition then? This is not a suffocating tradition. We like it. We follow it. You and I have sources for tradition. Quran is also full of tradition. The Hadith literature is full of tradition. Ahl al-Bayt are teaching us traditions. If you are a mother, you can look at baby Fatima and learn to be a mother of the kind she wanted to think about. If you are a brother, then you have a brother in Imam Ali. You have a brother in Abu al-Fazl al-Abbas. This is how the brothers behave towards one another. 
In everything there is a tradition. What if the tradition becomes distorted in the historical process? This is our question. You and I want truth. Allah Matabatabai is correct when he says that by nature, human mind is always seeking truth. You tell a story to the child and the first question when you tell the story of oh, the fairy came and the fairy came, there is the truth. You're telling an imaginary story and your children are asking you, is that true, Dad? Does it happen in the real life? Because they haven't seen it. They have never seen a, an angel. Why would they believe in something that they haven't seen? So the natural tendency is that they own an up. They are following the truth, wherever it takes them. Now, this is very interesting for us. In other words, from the very beginning, we have been given a sense of suspicion, which we call in Farsi Basvas. Baba Basvas Dari. You have law of suspicion. You know, they say Vaswas can be about Taharat. I become very much, you know, suspicious about the clothes I'm wearing. Is it clean or not? Vaswas about the food. Vaswas about so. Is there a Vaswas about thinking? Yes, there is a Vaswas about thinking. Am I right in my thinking? How many times this question comes to your mind and you are imagining things and you say, Am I right? I hope I'm not right. How many times have you told yourself, I hope I'm not right? You want to imagine about your friend something that is undesirable. You love your friend and you are, asking, you are telling yourself, I hope that's not true. I hope that person is not selfish, the way I'm thinking. Truth then is part of us. And if truth was not part of us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not have told us to follow the truth wherever it leads you. Ya ayyul ladhina amanu taqullah wa kunu ma sadiqeen. So in, in Allah's measurement, there are those who are sadiq and those who, those who are kadiq. Because the opposite is also true. Because Allah does say, لَعَنَةُ الْكَاذِبِينَ And whereas you know, sadiqin are praised by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sadiqin, and we are being told, if you are morally and spiritually aware, you must follow those who are truthful. You must be with those who are truthful. And most of the tafasir are saying, telling us that, this is a reference to the Ma'asumin alayhi musalam. Salawat ala Muhammad wa alayhi musalam. Sadiqin. Sidq. Sadaq. Truthfulness. Why should we search for it? Because we have inherited too many traditions. Whenever you and I speak about tradition, we are talking about written tradition. The time when the Prophet lived in the early community, they did not see anything. But the Prophet as total embodiment of the tradition and the Quran. The Quran was not a book. means this is a message that has been properly registered, in which there is no doubt. Kitab means properly registered. Doesn't mean kitab. Yes, the Prophet did ask his secretaries to write it down. For a different reason. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is symbolically mentioning kitab in the meaning of something that is registered in the mind, in the memory, in the tradition. Therefore, traditions are extremely important. And for us to be able to use any tradition as a paradigm, we need to make sure that the tradition is true. What we are being taught in the Quran is that you need to follow the truth. History, I'll tell you as a student of history, I'm saying, most of the histories that have come down to us, all in Arabic, written by so many great scholars, all the histories are inconclusive and non-categorical. That means what? 
We should read between the lines to believe in them. It's very important. The first Sira biography of the Prophet Sallallahu we have in our hands was written in the year 90 of Hijrah. Not only that, Ibn Ishaq was the main author. It was edited by Ibn Hisham, his own student. And his student, his student took the liberty of removing whatever he thought was his teacher not writing. So what you and I have inherited, seal of Ibn Hisham, is the edited version of what Ibn Ishaq wrote. So you and I are reading the biography of the Prophet Sallallahu which has come to us second, third, fourth hand. And what we have in our hand, this is the only one we have by the way. The only source of the biography of the Prophet. The Quran doesn't have the biography of the Prophet. Unlike Injil, which is the biography of Nabi Isa A.S., the Quran is not. There's only one sunnah where the reference is to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's orphanhood, orphanage and God guiding him and giving him all the information. There's only one surah, Alam Nashra. That's what we have, you know. And then you have books written after the Prophet Sallallahu And you and I are left with a lot of rich material. And we are reading it and we must read it. Let me tell you this much to add to my research. In my research I have found that only the first 70 years of the history of Islam are recorded with much care. Only for seven years. Only for seven years. From the time the Prophet did the Hijrah until the time I'm talking about 70 years of the Hijrah. So Makkah period, I leave it alone. Makkah is properly preserved here in the Quran. But Medina period is for 70 years, that means until the time of the event of Karbala and after Karbala, everything up to 70, you and I can read and feel relatively comfortable saying that, okay, we have history in our hand. Otherwise, histories were written under Banu Maya, under Banu Abbas, under different dynasties, and you wrote the history they dictated the history the way they wanted it. In other words, you and I have no access to the history but the first 70 years. And we depend on so many figures, Abu Meknaf, al madaini al zuhuri These are the early figures, by the way. And they're all in the first 100 years of Hijrah. That means in the first century. In other words, you and I, can we read history feeling very comfortable that you and I are reading solid history? I'll say no. Because we are reading between the lines. The authors are telling us, we don't even know if they were eyewitness. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has laid down the rule in the, in, the, in the book, saying that if the eyewitness doesn't tell you something, you have no obligation to accept it. If it's second and third and fourth hand, that means there is a given rule in the Quran that everything you read, you must ask question. This is known as retrieval. Baz yobi kardan. Baz yobi kardan. Baz yoftan. To understand, re understand. We are not talking about Baz Khani Kardan. We are not talking about rereading it. No, 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 no. We are reading about, we are talking about critical retrieval of the material. If we don't do that, we'll miss the point the Quran is trying to make. Laqad arsalna Musa bi ayatina. The Quran is telling us, we send, we send Moses with our signs. You and I are asking what signs were there. These are the major events of the, of the history of Banu Israel. Take out your community. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, made, is commanding Nabi Musa, take your community out of the darkness. Bring them to the light. So what is darkness? Darkness is those events not knowing them accurately. And nur is knowing them accurately. See, our, our responsibility is increasing. I'll come to it. In our monthly lectures, I'll come to it. But I want to tease you, to tease your minds tonight by giving you food for thought. Basically, what I'm, I'm saying is this. We need to realign the knowledge that God has given us through the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Yes. Actually, I'm monitoring this online. We are broadcasting this lecture, so there oh. are some boys who are actually listening. So they yes. have a question. So it's not my question. Oh, okay. What yes. is the question? The question is, why was it that it was not yeah, the history was not written properly after the first seventy? Because there were so many ideological interests in the community already. There were, and there were members of the community who were supporters of the Umayyad rule. They were supporters of the Abbasid rule. And they were patronized by these governments. So histories were not written independently. They were written under the tutelage and under the control of the rulers. And therefore we could not really believe in that. We could not really accept what they say. So, in other words, what we are talking about, that we want to realign our understanding. I'm talking about realignment. You know what is realignment? You know when you realign your wheels in your driving, what you do? So that your wheels run the car in proper direction, without effort, without, you know, hurting the, the tires. That's why you do realignment. You pay a lot of money every time you go. 60, 70 dollars they charge you. But they do realignment, that means the wheels are set properly so that they would move in the proper direction. So while you're willing towards right turn or a left turn, the wheel is turning very well without hurting itself. We need to realign our knowledge about our history. Here, please listen very carefully. Our effort is to realign the knowledge about history in such a way that it gives us the power to make a moral judgment. Moral judgment. What, it does, what does it mean that when we read the history, you and I can say, that was really a bad thing to happen. It should not have happened this way. This is what we call the moral judgment. Moral judgment is when you say, oh my God, this is terrible. This is not the right way to do the things. Did the prophet teach this? You will ask that question. This is known as our effort in realigning the knowledge with the truth. We want the knowledge to be closer to the truth. I don't think we can really claim absolute truth. But the history is a challenging task. And unless you read the history, you will never be able to understand what I am trying to push you to do. I want you to read history. But I want you to read with a pervasive suspiciousness. Be suspicious in what you are reading. Don't accept blindly what you are being told. The problem today of the Salafia, for example, is to accept the history the way it is. Why are the Salafis talking about only one way of thinking? It is either my way or no way at all, or I don't know what, what they say, you know. But in other words, the Salafis are telling us that there is, there is no need for you to think. We have done the thinking for you. You follow what we are telling you. We, we are telling you what is a true tradition, what is not a true tradition. What is shirk, what is not shirk. They are telling us, they are forcing the world to do that, by the way. And many Muslim brothers and sisters are resisting it. They say, no, you have no such right to make a decision on our behalf. And we are absolutely right in saying that. In other words, you and I have a responsibility. Our paradigm of the tradition depends upon our research. It depends upon our own understanding. How much should I accept what I'm reading? 
If you don't do that, you will, if you don't question that, you will never be able to reach the truth. Truth is sometimes hidden. There are political reasons for not allowing people to know the truth. We read about, for example, Noam Chomsky is notoriously known to be exposing the covering of the truth by the media. Noam Chomsky is a famous, by the way, you know, he's a critique of what we call the journalism. The kind of journalism that you and I are facing today is not based on any kind of research. Many of these stories are hearsay. That's why, you know, Charles, you know, Carl Mathieu or something, you know, that name. I, I read his columns just to see, just to enjoy how funny is this, you know, this history of, you know, telling lies about certain things, about certain people, about certain events. And they do it, by the way. The media can do it. Media can make you believe something that has never happened. If this is the role of the media today, that is the role of the storytelling in those days. The corsars, the storytellers, used to take you for a ride. They say in the Kufa, in the mosque of the Kufa, there was this preacher who used to stand there and talk to the public. He said, you know, if you take out your tongue and you are able to touch your nose with your tongue, then you enter paradise. People took out their tongues. They started touching their nose. They believed him. This was a lie. There could never be such a thing. That if you can touch your nose with, your, with the tip of your tongue, then you will enter paradise. Who said that? And people did believe that, by the way, because it was coming from the member. This was Kufa. People believed in these stupid things the way they were being taught. In other words, they had abandoned the critical mind which the Quran wanted to develop. You see what the Quran is trying? Look at the criticism of Christianity and Judaism. Look in the Quran very carefully. Why is the Quran criticizing them? They took their rabbis as their lords. What do you do in front of your lord? You submit. The Hindus say puja. They become pujari. They become worshippers. They don't believe in anything. But they worship blindly. And that's what the Quran is criticizing. That you can't be like that. If people tell you something, you need to think twice before you accept it. And this is what I call the critical retrieval. Our paradigm of the tradition will work only if we are capable of doing two things. Retrieving critically and retrieving creatively. Because sometimes you retrieve... I have students, I have PhD students, who want to destroy everything. They do research. I have a PhD student, UVA, he's still my student, by the way, and he does Quranic studies. You won't believe his interests. He's mostly interested in proving Jewish influences on the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He's Jewish himself, but he's in Quranic studies. He knows Arabic very well. He reads the Quran, and most of the time, he has this insidious mind. How many more are there like they're like, like these students? By the way, I get them. Our students write papers, by the way. And I read the papers, why don't you tell the Arabs to go back to where they came from? So where did it come from? And then you, when you find out the student has, you know, Weinberger, Steven Weinberger, or somebody like that, you know. So, you know, okay, okay, so I know this, this person has a quarrel with Palestinians. Why don't you take all the Palestinians in the Arab world so that we have no problem in, for Israel? Now, this is what we call reading history in the way you want to read it, and the way you inter want to interpret it, and this is what they write. These are our students in the university who are the cream of the intellectual production, so to speak. They've got SATs, flying SATs, and now you come to understand the prejudices. How many of us suffer from that kind of prejudice? Let's not talk about others, let's talk about ourselves. We have closed our minds many a times. We don't want to open our minds because we are afraid to do critical studies. Oh, critical studies. I got this email just yesterday from Tehran and said, my friend is telling me I should not be reading tafsir at all because it will create questions for me and I, I will lose my faith in the Quran. What's the fear? 
If I read the tafsir, I'm reading the interpretation. I don't have to, this is not the Quran, it's the interpretation of the Quran. I don't have to accept all the interpretation of the Quran. I might accept something that goes in my mind, something doesn't go in my mind, I cannot, I cannot accept it. What the Quran is teaching you and me is critical retrieval. Is that clear to you? It's a critical retrieval of the tradition. I and you want to understand what does God want from us. If we don't learn to do read the Quran critically the way I... You, critically, what does it mean? Critically means what? It means I want to understand each and every word of the Quran. I don't want to blindly say, this is what the Quran said. I've heard many women telling me, by the way, many Muslim women in the university telling me, oh, there is no verse about hijab in the Quran. I said, did you read the Quran? Well, I've been told by my teacher. What do you mean, who's, who's your teacher? You should read the Quran yourself before making any, passing any judgment. What do you mean there is no verse about hijab in the Quran? I can show you two, three places. How about that? In other words, we have this shallow knowledge and we say, oh, I know it's everything. I know, oh, I have read the Quran. How many times have you? Oh, I read the translation. I say, okay, fine, good. Read, read properly and try to understand and raise your questions by bringing the text in the class and tell me what text are you reading. Then I'll tell you, yeah, I think this is the correct translation. This is not the correct translation. You should not, you know, pay attention to it. In other words, we are taught to be retrieving the information about our religion critically, but also creatively. I don't want to destroy my faith. I want to keep it because I'm lucky to believe in God. And I want to keep that faith in God shining in me, qualitatively making a difference in my life. I want that kind of faith. And that's why I need to do to find that paradigm in the tradition. That tradition is extremely important for me. This is the ritual of the tradition I'm talking about, the paradigm that is built around the tradition. You and I cannot throw the tradition out. No. That's not the paradigm that we want to follow. Because our paradigm is based upon our understanding the Masumin. And let me explain to you my understanding of Isma. Isma doesn't mean that the Imam don't have shadow. You will hear about this. All Imams have no shadow. As Fatima has no shadow. Because she is Masum. No. What I'm saying is that there are perfect examples in which you will not find anything that you can criticize. This is Masum. Masum asam Allahu min zalal May God protect you from making errors in judgment. That's the meaning of my masum. Masum then is a perfect example. So when we talk about the masum, that's mean, that means you and I have full confidence in following them. If for you and me, Imam Zal al Abidin is a masum, that's what it means. There's nothing mysterious about it. People want to mystify Isma. They want to say, oh, they have no shadow, they have no this, they, they are not ordinary human beings. Then what is it that you are looking for? Then you and I will make a, an excuse on the day of judgment that we can't follow them. We couldn't follow them. They were Masumin. We couldn't follow them. <coughs> Whereas you and I are being told, Atiullah, Atiul Rasul, Ulul Amri Minkum. Follow those, follow Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, follow those, the Prophet Sallallahu and those who have been endowed, who have been given the authority. That means you do your research and find them out. How important are they for your life? This is what I think is quite mystifying. That we hear this, I have heard this many, many times, especially colleagues who come from India and Pakistan, when they sit on the member, they are shooting people with these ideas. They're telling me, you know, these are the people, no, they, they have no, you know, shadow. What do you mean? They're human beings. I'm a human being like you. I have a shadow. I eat, I drink, I walk in the markets. But I'm a human being like you. I drink, I walk in the markets. But I'm an example that you will not be able to get rid of me. You will not be able to make excuses. 
not to follow me. Because I'm a perfect example in front of you. I have lived a life that is impeccable. This is the meaning of Masum. And this is what we are searching for in the history. Where will we find the history that tells us about this Masum here? This is our search. So our paradigm cannot be Darwinian. It cannot be materialistic. It can only take us to that level where you and I can align the information, the knowledge with the truth. When this is done, then you, are, you and I are in a position to make a moral judgment. Others, we have no right to make a moral judgment. I have this eye in the Quran. You know, the Quran is very much worried about these storytellers. وَمِنِ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَشْتَرِ لَهُ الْحَدِيثِ لَيُذِلَّ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ بِغَيْرِ عِلْمٍ Look, look at the way the Quran is approaching the whole issue. Said, there are people who come, you know, tell you stories. They want to entertain you by telling false stories. And you get very happy because they are, they are telling, entertaining you. بِغَيْرِ عِلْمٍ They don't have even certainty of what they are telling you. وَيَتَّخَذَ هُزُوَ they are the ones who will be punished by God's severity. Why would God punish these people, these storytellers? Because they're cooking up lies. And to tell a, joke, a lie, even in a joke, is not allowed. Even while you're joking, you should not be telling a lie. You know, they say about Barzakh, the jokers who tell lies. They'll be doing the same thing in Barzakh, by the way. <laughs> they'll be telling lies, they'll be telling jokes. And they are waiting for the final judgment, you know, because you continue your life in the next, in the next stage of your life. I want to conclude and give you time to ask questions. But I want to conclude with this prayer that I love so much. Allahumma. أدخلنا في كل خير أدخلت فيه محمد وعلى آمين. I repeat. اللهم أدخلنا في كل خير أدخلت فيه محمد وعلى محمد وأخرجنا من كل سبل أخرجت من محمد وعلى محمد صلواتك عليه وعليه مجمعين اللهم إني أسألك خير ما سألك به بعدك الصالحون وأعوذ بك مما استعاذ منه بعدك المخلصون. آمين. Thank you very much for your attention. I have a duty to just, you know, communicate the questions. If there are five or six boys sitting, you know, elsewhere asking these questions. So their first question, I think the most relevant is, and I'm just reading, Professor Sanchadina is encouraging us to use critical thinking. But what if this critical thinking leads us down a path that runs counter the orthodox? In other words, our scholars hold a certain viewpoint. How can we, non-experts, develop a viewpoint that disagrees with it? I think it's a very important question because I, we, I come to this topic as a believer rather than a non-believer. And I am committed to bring the message to the larger audience that critical thinking in itself is not dangerous. Not knowing is dangerous. When you don't know something and you begin to criticize, then there's a problem. I'm talking about critical retrieval. That means you are reading something, you have a book in front of you, it is giving you a history, and you're supposed to read it with critical mind. You are not listening to something and accepting it blindly. I think what the danger lies when you are not informed yourself. At least you don't make an effort to inform yourself without any information. If you go to a subject, you know that when you take a course, the first two weeks, you are sitting quietly and listening to your teacher. Now when you are reading things, then the contradictions appear. What your teacher is telling, saying about certain things, and what your source is that you are reading, and then you begin to ask. 
by asking those critical questions, you're not going to lose the faith. Scholars who don't tease out the minds of their students are failing in their moral obligation. Because we have moral obligation to make our students think about issues. If you, if you understand the Quran, what it says, the Anbiya was sent, yuzakkihim wa yallimu al-kitab wa al-hikmah wa in ka'na min qablu la fi dhalali mabin the function of the Prophet is to become teachers. We are petty teachers compared to them. We know so little. But they as teachers, they taught us that what Abu Sufyan is doing, if you accept it uncritically, you will lead yourself to blindness. This is what the history is telling us. The Prophet did not say that no. Oh, even if Abu Sufyan says something, you accept it. No. I think what he meant was that look at the source that you are reading. Look at the scholar who is talking to you. There are scholars who are completely secular, completely atheist. And they are very honest, by the way. Some, some of us in the classroom, they come and say, I don't believe in anything. Clifford Gilts, who is the giant of sociology, anthropology of religion, and cultural anthropology, would always say, I don't believe in any religion. So don't expect me, you know, to come and talk about religion like that. So what he says about religion, you and I will take with a grain of salt. We'll not accept what he says. So in other words, we have increased responsibility when we use our minds critically. Are we willing to take the responsibility? The Quran says you must take it because I have given you your hearts, I have given you, I have given you minds, use them properly. You have more questions, Brother Abbas? I think I should let others yeah. ask okay. questions. Yes, ma'am. So, you have mentioned that. Go ahead, Abbas. You have mentioned that we have to go ahead and realign ourselves to the Islamic issues. It seems like, uh, if I put it in that form, it seems like all the ahadith that it was from Rasulullah, for many years it was the people were deprived to say, Qala Rasulullah. For many years after the Rehna of Rasulullah. But at the same time, they were allowed to go ahead and remember and curse Imam Ali. Was it that does it mean that there was a line that it is moving that today we are unfortunately separated from? Is it from the same time? Or that was a lack of alignment, a lack of realignment with the truth. In the, in, the time of, in the times of Bani Umayya, we find that with Muawiyah, up to 50 years, up to the time of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, you find that Imam Ali was cursed on all the man manabe, all the members of the Islamic world. This is what we call the lack of realignment between truth and morality. Because when you are realigned with the knowledge, with the correct knowledge, then you would hesitate to do it. And this is, by the way, the father of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz was Sulaiman. He said, this is not the right tradition. This is not the right thing to do. We can't curse Imam Ali. But he didn't have the, the what we call the guts that his son had. He said, no, we'll stop it. In other words, you do find that the moment you learn the truth, it increases the possibility of realignment between the truth and the moral judgment. And this is what has happened. That's why you, I think, I may have mentioned in other contexts that the only way to test the validity of any tradition is to realign it with the Quran. If we are not able to realign it with the Quran, then that tradition must be rejected. Because the Quran and the tradition, the tradition cannot contradict the Quran. We know for sure. It can